ox up. Check one two one two testing. Welcome everybody to today's colloquium. Before we start, I have a few messages as I usually do. So um, the Hutchins Center Honors will take place on October 4th. You've probably been reading about it. There are posters around. It's a medal ceremony. And among the recipients of the Du Bois Medal um, is Ava DuVernay. Um, tickets are available at the Harvard box office. Next week's colloquium will be delivered by Miles Osborne, and he'll be speaking on Mau Mau Are Angels, sent by Hale Selesi, a Kenyan war in Jamaica.
And now please welcome to the podium Alejandro de la Fuente. Um, he's professor of Latin American history and economics, as well as director of the Afro-Latin American Research Institute at the Hutchins Center. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to um, another colloquium. Today, I have the honor to introduce my colleague and uh, co-conspirator, co uh, David Byman. David is, of course, a member of the Hutchins family. He's uh, a rare fellow who keeps coming back, and we don't seem to be able to get rid of him in any way. <laughs> David is one of the most distinguished and productive art historians of his generation. And no, this is not an exaggeration. While his early scholarship was concerned with British art, recently, and much to the benefit of the Hutchins Center, Harvard University Press, and my own Afro-Latin American Research Institute, and indeed the world of art history, David's work has enlarged the scope of his discipline to encompass questions of popular art, race, nationality, representation, the role of aesthetics, and Darwinism and scientific racism. In the 1970s and 1980s, David focused on the re reclamation and reinterpretation of such artists as William Blake, William Hogarth, and John Flaxman, culminating in his innovative study, Blake as an Artist. This volume was the first scholarly understanding of Blake as an artist as well as poet in the context of his time. Having withstood the test of time, it is now a classic uh, text of art history. Exhibitions and other publications on not only Blake, but also Hogarth, the history of sculpture, and 18th century caricature quickly followed. In 1989, David curated the British Museum's exhibition, Shadow of the Guillotine, Britain and the French Revolution, which also led to the publication of a book. David's 1995 monograph, Rubiliac and the 18th Century Monument, published by Yale University Press and co-authored uh, with Malcolm Baker, earned the Mitchell Prize, which is often described as the equivalent in art history of, of a Nobel Prize. A social history of art, this work also served as something of a turning point in David's career. And after that, he began to give increasing attention to political, social, and religious themes that are now uh, central to his work as an art historian. In 2002, David's influential volume, Ape to Apollo, Aesthetics and the Idea of Race, 1700-1800, was published. And that was the first time I actually learned about his work because of my own interest on, uh, on race and racism. In 2005, David Byman and Henry Louis Gates Jr. resurrected the image of the black in Western art series. He and Skip were responsible for the editing and the introduction to 10 phenomenal volumes. If you have not seen this collection, go and take a look. This is nothing short of amazing. These were products of strong partnerships with other art historians, including our own Karen Dalton and Sheldon Schick, who are sitting somewhere back there as if they had nothing to do with this, right? Now with the companion volume, The Image of the Black in Africa and Asia, still hot of the press, David has plunged, much to my pleasure, into another companion volume, The Image of uh, the Black in Latin American and Caribbean art, in which we are working together. David is tireless. I understand that he has begun work on yet another project. This has to be after the Latin America volume, okay? The Latin America volume has priority. This time inspired by his 2009 essay on 19th century artist responses to Darwinism, a very interesting uh, topic. David taught for many years at the University of London and University College London, where he also served as head of the art department. He has written and edited many more books than I have managed to mention here, and more articles and essays that I can count. His scholarship and his teaching have been well recognized by more than a lifetime's worth of prestigious prizes, awards, grants, and fellowships. On top of all that, David, is one of the most personable, good-humored, and generous colleagues I have had the pleasure to work with. 
Please join me in welcoming our distinguished colleague, Professor David Byman, as he speaks on one of the chapters for the volume on the image of black in Latin American Caribbean art. David. Well, thank you, Alejandro, for a uh, very, very nice introduction. And um, obviously, with any of these projects to do with the uh, Hutchins Center, I've got uh, a, a lot of people to thank uh, for the help they've given me and the friendship over the years. And I mentioned just Skip, Abby, Krishna, Karen, Sheldon, Velma, among many others. Um, but I also wanted to acknowledge the enormous amount I've learned from fellows past and present, many of whom have been contributors to the, uh, the image of the black in Western art and have become friends. My talk today would have got nowhere if I hadn't had Katrina Dakers as a neighbor on the fourth floor. And in fact, my neighbors alone are a roll call of stimulating scholarship and continue to be so. And of course, I had the... Uh, the legendary Stephen Nelson uh, as a neighbor. Uh, and I'm particularly delighted that Adrian Childs, who was uh, a, a collaborator on an earlier volume, is here and has come from Washington, DC. Now, uh, as Alejandro has said, my task for this semester and the next is with Skip and Alejandro himself to bring out a second companion volume to the image of the black in Western art this time entitled The Image of the Black in Latin America and the Caribbean, which has the rather nice acronym of IBLACK. Um, this is now through the planning stage and all the essays have been assigned. And the next stage will be a workshop on December the 11th and 12th to which uh, all fellows are warmly invited. And Alejandro is broadly in charge of Latin America and I'm, again, broadly in charge of the Caribbean. And today I want to present a draft of a chapter I will be writing, which will give you the flavor of our general approach in the volumes. It is on the uh, famous paintings of 18th century Caribbean life by the Italian painter Agostino Brunias. But first I want to talk about the, the broad setting of the 18th century Caribbean in which they were produced. And here's a map. Um, and the Caribbean is, in Edward Sullivan's words, and Edward Sullivan is a contributor to the volume, an aqueous continent with islands of all shapes, sizes, and climates, ruled and exploited seemingly randomly in the 18th century by European powers. Let's say that's the British, French, Spanish, Danish, and Dutch. And modern writers like M.A. Césaire, uh, Edouard Glissant, and Derek Walcott have emphasized the cultural unity of the Caribbean, its African roots, its hybridity and variety, or its distinctive climate and vegetation. But there is another story of the Caribbean islands in the 18th century as belonging to vast networks of slave colonies extending across America and the southern states of North America, interconnected through maritime trading networks and through ports in both North and South America on the rim of the Caribbean. And if there's one thing that unites the Caribbean, it is movement through the sea roads between the islands themselves, but also between the islands and the neighboring continents and the more distant ones. Far from being barriers, oceans were thoroughfares that created connections between continents, linking together the Caribbean with America, North and South, Africa and Europe. They were also battlegrounds between the European powers, and by the end of the century, the newly formed United States. The Caribbean islands themselves were also fluid, often dealing with frequent changes of rule by different European powers. Populations do not shift overnight, though new settlers might be added to the mix. There is also constant fluidity in the relationship between geography and power. If Latin America was largely Spanish, 
and had been for some centuries before the 18th century, the Caribbean islands were always vulnerable to being taken over by different European powers or reduced to counters in a treaty negotiation. By the Treaty of Paris in, in 1763, Cuba could be transferred back to Spain by the British in exchange for Florida. By the same treaty, the British exchanged Guadeloupe, which they had recently captured from the French, for their right to retain French Canada. In the 18th century, the most important determinant of types of representation in the Caribbean was the occupying power. Spain was the dominant power in Latin America, but also had large islands in the Caribbean, like Cuba and Puerto Rico. Trinidad was Spanish until 1797, when we became British, but it had been occupied before then largely by French settlers from Martinique. Guadeloupe and Martinique were and still are French, but had periods under British rule. It is vital for an understanding of Brunias's paintings to note that Dominica, St. Vincent, and Granada had been French. Um, there's Dominica. And you notice that Dominica lies between Guadeloupe and Martinique. And then you've got Anguilla up there, which is British, um, and uh, so on, and Barbados. All, all these places have very complicated histories. Um, and in fact, Dominica, St. Vincent, and Grenada were ceded to Britain also as part of the 1763 treaty. They briefly reverted back to France from 1778 to 1783. Uh, though the British government tried to exploit the islands economically, the settler uh, population of the, uh, these ceded islands um, became, and there's St. Vincent down there, um, remained largely French, and they were close to and supplied provisions to the populous nearby French islands of Guadeloupe and Martinique, which reach about 25 miles from Dominica. In the volume, we are proposing to emphasize not the differences, but the interconnections between Latin America and the Caribbean by choosing themes that, where possible, apply to both. One important theme is the visual culture of racial mixture, which is dominated in the 18th century by two major groups of paintings. The first is the remarkable phenomenon of Castor painting in Mexico and also Peru, in which varieties of racial mixture involving um, European, African, and native peoples were expressed schematically in paintings in which each parent and offspring is depicted and identified according to their racial identity. And here you can see uh, Spaniard and black, which produces a mulatto, and then um, all sorts of variations um, uh, uh, up to something like the fifth remove um, uh, uh, are expressed in series of paintings. And then the other uh, broad group of paintings is the work of Brunias, who painted scenes from daily life in Dominica and St. Vincent. Also central to understanding is the nature of the economy Sugar economies, whether in Latin America or the Caribbean, could make owners of sugar plantations very rich, and their profitability was, or was believed to be, based on employing large gangs of imported African slaves to work under extreme coercion. The bigger Caribbean islands, like Jamaica, Cuba, and Saint-Domingue, uh, which of course included Haiti, uh, supported large sugar estates under wealthy planters, as did smaller, more northerly British islands like Antigua and St. Kitts. But lesser Antilles islands, like Dominica and St. Vincent, were volcanic and hilly, which meant that sugar plantations could only flourish on the coast, and consequently were not often big enough to be very profitable. The economy of these islands was, at least before the British took over in 1764, largely in the hands of French smallholders, mainly devoted to coffee, cocoa, and tobacco, and supplying provisions to other islands, 
none of which were as profitable as sugar. So in much smaller numbers and potentially less impressive conditions than on the sugar plantations. Uh, William Young, who is from 1769, Sir William Young, first baronet, and 1770 governor of Dominica, was sent by the British government in 1764 to sort out land ownership and produce an economic plan for the islands of Dominica, St. Vincent, and Grenada, which uh, we soon were ceded by the French in 1763. His principal task as the president of the Commission for the Sale of Lands in the Ceded Islands was to convert as much of the islands as he could to sugar production. He set out his expectations in the 1764 London pamphlet, which emphasizes the difficulties of creating a profitable sugar economy. And I quote, these islands are not the promised land flowing with milk and honey, as in the garden of the Hesperides, the fruits cannot be gathered without Herculean labor. So a wonderful mixture of biblical and classical references. And um, now, Young was aware that not all settlers were plutocrats with large estates and numbers of slaves. There were wide differences among them in wealth, social position, and attitudes towards slavery. Some thought that slavery was justified by the na natural order of things, others that it was an unfortunate necessity that one day would come to an end, and there were those who were indifferent towards it. The first position um, was promoted strongly by um, Edward Young, Edward Long, the author of the History of Jamaica, 1774, who accepted the economic and moral logic of plantation slavery without equivocation. This led him to speculate that Africans might be of a different species from Europeans biologically destined to be slaves. And in a way, he's arguably the founder of, of modern racism. He also adopted a high moral tone towards his fellow settlers, excoriating those who had black or mulatto mistresses, and especially those who had children by them. This, the tendency of white settlers to have sexual relations with black women and mulatress had so long believed immeasurably immeasurable social consequences that would lead to the decline of the colonial, colonial project. Such fleshly weakness, he said, created a vast addition of spur spurious offspring of different complexions if little restraint is laid on the passions. There were many who agreed with Long in both British and French colonies and sought in the name of civic virtue to raise racial barriers to protect white settlers. But there were also many who took a different view, if not in theory, certainly in practice. Sexual relations between white men and black women had been an integral part of the exploitation of slaves wherever slavery was established. For many young men coming as soldiers or sailors, government officials or to work on plantations, the Caribbean was a liberation from the limiting sexual conventions of European life. For some English writers and artists, especially the view, views of, of Long and other ostensibly high-minded slave owners, would have seemed hypocritical and puritanical. Henry Fielding's novels and William Hogarth's engravings present, presented a view of life that found mocking humor in pomposity and the display of rank and morality. Though not necessarily opposed to slavery, it was only in the 1770s in 1780s that anti-slavery became a public cause, they tended to have a view of sex as a natural appetite uh, in which they were opposed to excessive indulgence as well as moralistic denial. Um, this is um, Hogarth's famous print of strolling actresses in the barn. Um, and again, um, a, a, an erotic or titillating subject and you can see up top a small boy um, looking, th and there he is in, in detail. You can see him up there observing the scene, and peeping toms are important to my argument, as you'll see later on. Um, 
And then in noon, from the Times of Day series, a young black grabs the breast of a serving maid uh, who shows some consternation but offers no resistance. William Young, like Long, accepted the economic need for slavery, but he was also familiar with the intellectual, artistic, and theatrical scene in, in London. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1748, and he was on friendly terms with the great actor David Garrick, who was also a friend of Hogarth. Now, Young's sophisticated artistic interests are clear from the large and carefully composed painting um, com uh, of him and his family commissioned from Johann Zoffany and probably painted in the early 1760s. And there he is in Van Dyck costume. Um, and the main group is engaged in singing to the parents' instrumental accompaniment. Um, and that, of course, is a kind of allegory of the harmony of the family. The painting's emphasis on family life implicitly detaches Young from the world of unrespectable planters who avoided marriage or neglected their wives. So his association with actors and artists might suggest a more relaxed attitude to those who strayed. Now, William Young plays a very important part in this story because he brought with him uh, the young artist Agostino Brunias uh, to the Lesser Antilles in the late, uh, later 1760s. And Brunias produced over the years until his death a richly compelling group of paintings and engravings that provide an attractive view of life in Dominica and St. Vincent. Brunias also sought actively to sell his paintings and prints in London during the years from circa 1775 to 1784, trying where possible to reach wealthy people with Caribbean interests. He exhibited at the Royal Academy um, and of the six uh, dedicatees of his engravings, and I show an engraving here, um, Uh, at least three, including William Young himself, were large plantation owners in the Lesser Antilles. Interestingly, he returned to the Caribbean and eventually came to see Dominica as his home. As has often been observed, in Brunias's paintings, the central space in many, of his, uh, in many is uh, occupied by a beautifully dressed mulatress who radiates erotic authority. Such women were themselves the consequence of the sexual attraction felt by white settlers for black or mulatto women, and they were in turn exploited sexually by them. And I went on this weekend and saw a Clara Walker exhibition in New York, and I was very struck by how she's clearly um, very much concerned about the complexities of the, the sort of sexual dynamics uh, involved in, in slavery. Um, their dominant physical presence and their intermediate position between higher and lower social classes and different skin colors was an issue for both French and British settlers and those who administered the colonies. For planters like Long, the mulatress was a temptress, a product and supplier of illicit sex to those who put pl private pleasure above civic duty. That Brunias was fully aware of the satirical stream in British art represented by Hogarth and also by Rowlandson is clear from the painting um, Mulatress and Negro women bathing, um, one of four paintings by Brunias that have been at Harvard since the 18th century. And they are, they belong to the Peabody, but they are actually on display at this very moment in the Harvard Art Museum uh, as part of the 
that rather wonderful exhibition on the philosophical chamber. Um, and this painting shows um, Mulatress varied skin color, including one uh, dark skinned, um, bathing in a stream observed, and I think you can see in there, observed by a concealed white face um, in the, the background, Peeping Tom. Um, the wim women's signs of agitation suggest that some have suddenly become aware of him. And the whole scene with a statuesque figure uh, or seated in the middle is suggestive of uh, Actian's intrusion into a gathering of Venus and her companions, a familiar subject in European painting. So like a lot of Hogarth's paintings, you've got a sort of risque subject, but a certain uh, reference to uh, classical antiquity. The barely concealed face is a surrogate for the observer and reveals the voyeurism behind some of uh, Brunias's paintings. A similar scene that was engraved but does not show an observer had a, has a dedication of the print to a planter suggesting that Brunias did not expect a negative reaction to such subjects from his potential patrons. Um, and indeed, the very respectable um, colonial official who gave the, uh, the painting to Harvard uh, would have been uh, an example of this. What is striking in all his paintings is the complete lack of moralizing counterweight to the painting's overtly sexual gaze. Though Brunias was selective in his representations of the island and emphasized sociability and pleasure, his vision was shared by Thomas Atwood, who in 1791 describes, and I quote, the free people of color as remarkably fond of dress and dancing. Dancing is the chief part of their amusements, their preparations for which are commonly very expensive, though ladies being usually dressed in silks, sil silk stockings and shoes, buckles, bracelets, and rings of gold and silver to a considerable value. Now, Brunias focuses on beautiful people of all skin colors, but he, and, but he does give occasional glimpse, glimpses of slaves and slavery as he might have seen it in towns in the countryside. And uh, in the background, in the, the painting you can see there, a young half-naked black man rolls a large uh, barrel along the street, apparently under the eyes of a watchful master. And then there's another small boy there. Um, but of course, what he doesn't show is plantation slavery. It is remarkable that Brunias painted almost exclusively people of mixed color. There are a few obviously white settlers or fully African looking people. Um, a disputed example of the former is the well-dressed couple buying cloth from a mulatto woman in Rosso in Linen Market uh, in Dominica, which is in the Yale Center for British Art. And you see the well-dressed couple there um, and uh, buying cloth. Um, now, Diane Chris, who's written an excellent book on the, the subject, um, has claimed that the woman might, in fact, be a light-skinned uh, mulatress. But her male companion, you can see him in the top hat, is certainly a white settler or visitor. If she is indeed white, then the pa painting might have been intended to offer reassurance to potential investors that the islands were safe and picturesque, but also offered opportunities for shopping. But the very uncertainty that we feel between white and mulatto makes an important point in itself, which when taken with the wide variety of skin colors represented in the paintings, suggests a desire contrary to Long and French officials to blur rather than clarify the barriers between the populations of the islands and to show racial mixture as natural and even positive. Though differences in dress are made visible, 
it would be very difficult for someone not familiar with the islands at the time to make discriminations based on class divisions. Even so, in free women of color with their children and servants in a landscape, which belongs to the uh, Brooklyn Museum, the three women who lead the procession are clearly distinguished from their darker-skinned servants, um, who are also, however, well-dressed. The three boys on the right are intriguing. The smallest boy in yellow striped uh, garments has blonde hair and appears to be completely white. The two black boys uh, are dressed in what appears to be military dress, but tellingly they have bare feet. The three adult male servants are equally well dressed in uh, military costume, um, in military garments, which may suggest that they are in the militia like many mulatto men in French colonies, or it could just be the kind of dressing up observed by Atwood. On the far left, um, a small blonde-haired boy is carried on the shoulders of a black nurse. There also seems to be distinctions within the group of three leading women. The two to the right are conspicuously more elegant than the third woman, who appears older and wears an apron on her lower body and striped clothing like the black servant behind her. The other two women seem more subtly distinguished uh, from each other. Um, the woman, woman in the middle wears a white dress um, and points imperiously towards the little white boy to the right. Could she be the white wife of a plantation owner? Um, the woman immediately to her left has a colored upper garment holds a red cloth and looks possibly deferentially towards her companion. We can only guess at to, uh, who or what the group represents, but one possibility is that they are the household of a wealthy planter, including the mistress of the house and two of the children. Brunias's paintings illuminate in a particularly telling way the complexities of human interaction in the fluid Caribbean of the 18th century. Though brought over by a British planter who had the specific task of exploiting the recently acquired islands of Dominica and St. Vincent for the British government, uh, the islands that Brunias represented were still largely French in culture. African slaves and native Caribs were treated in a way ways inflected by distinctively French attitudes, just as slaves in Cuba were treated in a Spanish way. Yet attitudes towards slavery were always fundamentally affected by the nature of the work for which they were recruited, which in turn was affected by the crops they cultivated. The complexities of these processes hardly compare with attitudes towards racial mixture there could be infinite gradations of skin color which interacted with social class in ways that can be unfathomable. One might think that a higher degree of whiteness would signify higher rank, but that could be challenged by children of settlers of high status who consorted with mulatto or black women. Further confusion was caused by the sexual appeal of dusky beauties, beautifully dressed, and thoroughly conscious of their power over European men. While puritanical figures like Edward Long showed distaste for those of mixed race, the latter could also assert their rights to power and respect, respect on the grounds of their own patrician ancestry, and in some cases, an education comparable to their white progenitors. All of this suggests a quite different purpose an approach from Castor painting, which was in essence taxonomic, seeking to classify and name differences of color and appearance according to specific racial categories. Such paintings give visual form to racial hierarchies with a white Spaniard on the top and mixtures 
of African and native peoples further down. Brunias shows differences of skin color, appearance and clothing, but the visual confusion between white and mulatto suggests that his paintings were not meant to provide any sort of taxonomic picture of the racial and social gradations of the islands. It seems to me to be significant that Brunias settled in Dominica and remained there for the rest of his life, and that there is strong evidence that he had a mulatto partner and two children, and that evidence comes from the work of Lennox Honeychurch, a, a, a historian of uh, Dominica, who actually uh, met descendants of, uh, of Brunias, or almost certainly descendants. Uh, he may also believe that he'd found a clientele for his paintings in the relatively small but affluent plantocracy of the Lesser Antilles, though we lack information about sales. We know nothing of his political views, whether or not he supported slavery, but there are signs that he did not have a strong attachment to England. He was Italian by birth, and he did not seek a position in the London art world like some other Italian artists. He is most likely to have been one of the many settlers who found a kind of freedom in the fluidity of a slave society that would not have been possible in Europe. Now, Brunias was trained as a narrative or history painter in a continental tradition and not as either a landscape or a portrait painter. His concern with real-life figure painting has parallels with the career of the painter who might have been his mentor, and that's John Zoffany, whom we've already seen. There is much more to be done in locating Brunias's art in the continental and London art scene of his own day and providing a more considered account of his relationship to realist traditions in the first three quarters of the 18th century. His art also needs to be seen against the Frenchness of the ceded islands in terms of the manners, morals, signs of status and clothing of the inhabitants. This further opens up the question of the texture of daily life in the Caribbean. How different was the personal display of slaves or free blacks under British, Dutch, French or Spanish rule? Is the assertive mulatress so prominent in Brunias's paintings a consequence of French attitudes that are not replicated under the rule of other nations? It is also clear from the work of Anne Lafont that Brunius had a strong influence on French colonial art in the period and on decorative arts. And there's a famous set of buttons after Brunias that are uh, supposed to have uh, belonged to Toussaint Louverture. Um, this leads on to the larger question of the constant and complex interactions in the Caribbean between Africa, uh, Europe and native Caribs, including those of mixed descent, but also between Europeans of different nations and the slaves brought up under their rule. This difference is hinted at in Brunias's print, a cudgeling match between English and French Negroes uh, in the island of Jamaica. Um, and uh, which suggests that the slaves themselves assumed a distinct identity conditioned by their owners, though it is not uh, uh, at all clear which, which are English or uh, French slaves in the image. I'd be interested to know if anyone can spot any clues to that. Um, and um, there is clearly some significance in Brunias's use of words in the captions to his engravings, and we can assume that they're broadly, they are his own words. The word Negro is applied to the dark-skinned and obviously working class, while the lighter-skinned are described as, uh, in one case, as West Indian, um, as in the engravings of washerwomen and flower girls, or free natives, or in one case, uh, there's an image of described as of a Barbados mulatto girl. Alongside claims of Brunias's anthropological approach have come attempts to relate his work to emerging theories of race. 
This is a problematic subject because although there have been studies of racial theory in the 18th century, including my own, less attention has been paid to their dissemination and how, why, and where it entered into common discourse. Of those discussed in this essay, the one person who might have been aware of the advanced racial theory of his time was Edward Long, but his knowledge would have been highly selective. He might have known of Linnaeus and Buffon, but it is almost inconceivable that he would have read Kant's writings on race of the 1770s. But the dissemination of racial theory from the 17th century onwards is a subject well worth exploring. Finally, there's the question of the interpretation of images of the West Indian colonies. As is well known, uh, it, 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 that the truth effect of paintings is not to be relied on. Images are always mediated through the sensibility of the artist and the desire to sell her or his work, though how these manifest themselves is not always easy to see. In Brunias's case, we can confirm that the picture he paints of daily life in the ceded islands does broadly correspond to verbal, verbal descriptions of the time, but then he would have had a strong motive to create a benign vision of da daily life, either from his patron's influence or his desire to sell paintings to white settlers. I've argued that the latter motive was up uppermost in his mind, but clearly in the pace, case of picturesque landscape, the attitudes implicit in the genre would have been in harmony with the settler's desire to see the Caribbean in an idyllic light. The artist's selective vision is always likely to prevail, but there are also degrees and kinds of selectivity. Slavery can be condemned or avoided, or it can be depicted as a natural and humane part of society. So much depends on the place depicted and the time. And events were shifting dramatically in the last quarter of the 18th century. The shadow of abolition hung increasingly over the slave economies of the Caribbean. And the res restiveness of the slave and mixed race population was to catch fire before the end of the century, most notably on the nearby island of Saint-Domingue. Thank you very much. Yes, of course. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that you could perhaps trace who is French and who is English by looking at the clothing that the French are likely to have, the Madras colorful head headgear, and the um, English ones would be more like that, the red, uh, the plain. Oh, I see, yes. You think yeah. this, this one would be yeah. French? And yeah. Then you could, uh, I don't know why I um, um, guess, but, but cloth is um, a very important uh, way of identifying people in the Caribbean uh, because, as you say, they tend to reflect the national or European uh, power. Yes, I, I think that's, that's a very Im important point, and uh, it's something I feel a, a, is a something I need to inquire into further is the whole question of dress codes. And in fact, um, you there does seem to be, uh, there seem to be certain styles of wearing hats that I think are associated with the uh, mulatto rather than, and, and you can make a distinction in that sort of way um, in, in several cases. Um, but I, I wonder how consistent it will turn out to be, but it's certainly an inquiry that I need to carry out from now on, yes. Thank you, yes. Yes. However, the mulatto is frequently uh, a, a male figure. Um, so I think that speaks to the distinction that you Post about the purposes uh, of these uh, paintings, but there is this gender dimension that probably needs to be uh, explored as well, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes, no, it, it's clearly quite central, and and of course it's also an ongoing consideration uh, even to the present day. Um, yes, 
And in fact, in some ways, it, it seems to be a whole area that's not really dealt with very satisfactorily in most histories. But of course, it's, uh, I mean, it's a, a fact of daily life and, 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 uh, and has resonances at every level of, of the relationship. Do you have representations uh, from Brunias of uh, mulatto uh, men? Uh, there are one or two, yes, yes. But, well, again, it's not absolutely certain, but yes, there do seem to be mulatto men. I think there's one of the images I showed. Um, let me see if I can find it um, quite early on. Uh, because this because in the on. case of women, he, he, he explicitly makes reference to, you know, mulatre. Right, so yes. that's that's yes. a female mulatto. Yes. Do you have something comparable, like uh, like a titled piece mm, that no. would make reference to a mulatto man? No, there isn't anything. I mean, titles are always problematic anyway, because in the engravings, and there are only six of them, you can be pretty sure those are his words. Um, but you know, the titles of the paintings are simply put on later and don't necessarily have any authority. Um, but I think this this is a one case possibly, um, but of course the cur is again very French and um, uh, may be meant to be a, a French settler, I don't know. Uh, and I think again the question of, of costume is probably harder to unscramble with the, the male figures. Yes. Um, David, I remember seeing uh, at the the castle in St. Vincent, right on the top of the hill there. Yes. Um, this rather extraordinary set of paintings which told the story of how people had come to um, St. Vincent. And quite who painted them and when is escaping me a little bit as I'm not an art historian. Um, but I wondered whether, do we have examples of paintings by non-European artists? Do they support this picture or complicate it? Um, what do they tell us in comparison to this story? Well, um, or at least, and I would, I, if you'd asked me a few months ago, I said, well, I, I didn't know of any. But um, I'm developing a theory at the moment that probably the most famous early 18th century of a painting of a, done in Jamaica um, is in f of, of a black person is in fact uh, a self-portrait. Um, but there, there are no records, of, uh, at least to my mind, of anyone trained there. The, the, the in France, you've got um, a very, very distinguished painter, Le Pierre, um, who was um, of mixed race and who eventually, um, and he became a, a high official in the French art establishment, but he still volunteered to paint the foundation picture in, of, of the Haitian Revolution. Um, and he identifies himself as, uh, as being of, of, uh, of, of, of of African descent. Um, so you've got that case. Um, but I don't know, by and large, uh, all, all the, there are quite a few painters who went over from London and who are known and listed, and some stayed, um, and most went back. Um, but that was, uh, again, something that I got a lot about, but I haven't, you know, didn't have time to put it in. But um, th there are, there's a whole range of people who are more specialists in portrait paint artists um, who are also specialists in landscape um, who also came over and the genre of their art is quite different from uh, um, from Brunias um, but it may well be that um, that in the French colonies that some of them the artists were of mixed descent um, but I, I, I I don't know about that yet, anyway. Yes, I was going next. Thank you, David, yes. um, for um, this presentation. And I really like that you began with the um, British portraits in terms of the ways in which uh, particularly black children were used as yes. um, um, kind of uh, accessories, I guess you yes. might say. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of work that's been done on how uh, there was a, these portraits conceal uh, the existence of slavery in, in England. And um, I was wondering if that same kind of concealment is going on here through very similar style. And I, I, was thinking, I, I was thinking of the one, I too was looking at the clothing, 
you know, yes. because I'm not familiar with the with the French clothing so much as the Dutch, but I think I mentioned this to you that they had very strict yes. uh, codes having to do with color and status in yes. terms of who could wear what. Yes. And uh, one thing is that slaves could not wear was shoes. Yes. And um, the the painting, the free women of color and their children and servants, of course it's the title that struck me because these are slaves and not servants. And you said it may have been added later. Yes, it, that's, that's, I don't think there's any authority in that title at all. Right, but the two boys are not wearing shoes, yes. right? Yes. Um, but I am wondering if the slave women have been dressed in a way, they're obviously house slaves, not field slaves, but dressed in a way to kind of uh, blur the distinction um, between slave and service stat servant status. Yes. Um, because what struck me the whole time I was looking at, as you were going through the paintings and you m pointed out the two um, black men that were, all, that were very uh, sparsely dressed. Yes. Um, who were slaves, but I was trying to identify whether there were any slave women and well, I, in I'm any of these paintings, because they're all free women of color. Well, except that, yeah. yes, I mean, in fact, I, uh, in the longer version of this, mm -hmm. I, I talk about um, a painting which shows uh, a number of young women with uh, topless young women okay. cleaning a house, basically, okay. and they're clearly yeah. slaves, and they clearly have a, yes. uh, you know, but also erotic charge as well. Yes. Yes. Because yeah, because I, I, I mean, I at least from what you showed us, they seem to be a kind of presentation of free women of color, as if there's this benign kind of coexistence that is operating through these women's bodies because they are mixed race. Well, I, I think that this is a, a big debate that goes through al almost all the writings of white settlers at the time um, when uh, women were well dressed. Was that a sign of, of you know, the uh, benign attitudes of their, the, the slave community, or was it actually a dangerous thing that would um, get, uh, lead them to think above their, their, their social class? Um, so that's, I think, always a, a, a problem for white settlers is, is how far to uh, allow display. Um, and in fact, the what I'm also exploring is the um, is the, the the transfer from the French islands because it appears in the French islands shortly before that there were laws brought in to restrict the dress of the uh, of, of free women of color um, and that a lot of them moved to Dominica to get out get away from those laws but I haven't been able to confirm that yet but that does seem to be a a possibility, yes. Um, but I, I think again, um, there's also the suggestion that, uh, that that slaves would wear the kind of insignia, in some sense, of the families who owned them, and it may be that may account for certain kinds of clothing that they would wear, so they'd be identifiable as property of a particular family. Thank you so much for this uh, beautiful presentation. I am very interested in the idea of comparison. This is related to what Alejandro was asking. You start your presentation by basically comparing the, um, the art that was being produced in Latin America, like the pasta painting, yes. uh, with, the with what was being done in the Caribbean. And I would like you to um, uh, talk a little bit, if you can, about how to think about this comparison? How can we understand the art that was being produced in, in these two huge uh, areas? Of course, like there are many things that come to, that, that you have mentioned already, like the idea of who, was, uh, who were the, the colonizers. In, in the case of Latin America, the, the presence of the indigenous population was a, a huge, uh, was, a, was very important. But how can we problematize, so you, you mentioned one uh, similarity, which is this idea of miscegenation, and how can we think about it to tease out the nuances between um, 
Latin American art and Caribbean art. Well, I mean, you've, you've put your finger on what's probably the biggest single problem that we've got in doing this volume, um, because in a way there isn't such a thing as Latin American art. There are just so many different countries with different traditions. There's no, and there are different circumstances in each of these countries, as indeed there are across the Caribbean. And I tried to draw a distinction, implicit distinction between Jamaica, which is more than a thousand miles from the uh, Dominica and St. Vincent, um, and with the, the different conditions within the Caribbean. Um, and of course, Shasta painting seems to, as far as we know, only really exists in Mex Mexico and in, in Peru. Uh, but we may find things similar to it as we go on. But what we're talking about is, you know, in a way, a terra incognita um, for the kind of scholarship that we're doing because um, there's such a, a, a range of different circumstances in Latin America as well as across the Caribbean that uh, whatever, what generalizations we can make, um, I, I simply don't know at this point. And what, what do you think, Alejandro? That's right, yes. <laughs> I mean, in a way, what we're trying to do is to answer that question, but also in the, the strong expectation that we won't really be able to uh, do more than uh, get a certain way with any answer. Um, before I make my comment, this seems to be a mulatto uh, boy back there in the doorway. Uh, I don't know, because we're talking about are there any men. Um, but the, what I wanted to say was um, about both the, the market day, Dominica, and uh, the, the uh, free women of color. Um, the, the free women, well, okay, uh, the, I, you, we had this in the exhibition in Florida. Oh, right, we yes. So ha well, happy to have you write for our catalog. And this was probably the most controversial and popular painting. I, is it, am I, can you guys hear yes, me? Yes, yes. That's so crazy. Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, it was the most controversial and popular painting there. And uh, the way we interpreted it, and maybe I'm wrong because I ne uh, was that the woman under the red umbrella was probably a you know a mulattress, a, a mixed race woman, and that I wasn't sure that the man behind her was uh, her was her companion. Oh, you, you were just there, him. Uh, the guy behind her was her companion, uh, right? Oh. Um, and so, and also, I was wondering about the the notion of the market day that that perhaps there was a certain day that all of the black people could actually have their own market uh, in, in the, the port. Yes, the, the were, there were particular days. Days, yes. and then who yes. the, they, they would be the only ones really allowed or uh, to come there. Uh, so this woman would be um, uh, part of that mixed race community and that the white men um, were still are going to be able to come and, and just and encounter them. So in other words, there's always this sort of wire type that you were talking yes. about. And yes. he, he kind of uh, is the embodies that presence of the, the gaze of the white male and the availability of these women yes. uh, to him at, at, and that type of person at, at, at any it, it, whether they're bathing, whether they're in the market, I mean, even the family of you, Mula, the, the Mulatresses or the mixed race uh, free people, I, I wonder whether those women are, are owning, the owning those slaves and that the, the women. Well, yes. Uh, yeah, so there's this whole thing about um, them, perhaps those children are her children with the, the implied white uh, planter or white man, you know. Yes, I mean, it's certainly, I mean, um, uh, certainly I, I think that but a wealthy Mura yeah, could, could she well could be a slave yeah. owner, and yeah. uh, and so it, it's just so complicated. And it's interesting that there it's so freely sort of discussed, if you will, in this. And in the United States, we have the same thing going on, and you know, in, in yeah. New Orleans and all of that. And and but in the 20th century, we don't talk about it. I mean, it's almost our shame in the black community. It's our shame that this kind of uh, these distinctions. Um, it's it's a still remains a fissure in our. Our, our society, uh, but yeah. um, it, it's so freely d bandied about here, and I still don't really understand wh what the whether he's he trying to attract colonists or is he trying to assuage anxiety about this this you know the menace of race in the colonies. I mean, it's really it's very. I, I still don't get a, a read on it. I mean, do you have a, one, a if you were to say one reason why you think he's obsessed with this? Do you have a well, uh, yes, I suppose what I was 
um, very tentatively uh, arguing was that Brunias in some ways is outside the, if you like, the colonial discourse because he's first of all Italian and also that he you know, settles there with, uh, 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 and has children there that in a way he may have in fact simply um, seen it in, uh, at face value as it were. Um, and, um, but here I think in this case, very elaborate painting and it may be in this case, I mean if it is a, a white person, these two are white people, um, that he may have been, um, that, I mean Young who did have a very specific interest in encouraging people to come to uh, uh, settle in, in, uh, in Dominica might have asked him to uh, emphasize how friendly and how you know, enjoyable, you know, sort of tourist, how welcome it was to <laughs> shopping, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, uh, so on. So, uh, uh, but it, it, I'm by no means certain about it at all. I mean, if you look at the headdress, I mean, the, this seems to me very specifically a kind of um, mulatto type headdress. Um, and again, the fact that she's dressed in, in white, um, I don't know if there's, she, this one is also mostly in white as well on, on that one. So I, I don't have any, uh, you know, feel any certainty about it. I think the fact that she's uh, going around with a, someone who's holding an umbrella um, might suggest a, um, a kind of conspicuous ownership of a slave that might have been difficult for a mulatto woman at that point. Um, I mean, I think it, it was legal certainly for people who were uh, at least almost white to own slaves, um, but it may have been regarded as a, uh, you know, tactless as it were to uh, parade it. So that would slightly lean this, uh, lean me in favor of thinking she was white. And I'm pretty sure he is because of the hat. Um, and he's uh, again, um, so, uh, and he could be looking lecherously at her. That's um, uh, one point. Or on the other hand, we don't know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it, uh, it, it probably says more about us than um, <laughs> the, 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 to come to a conclusion. Yeah. Dr. Byman, thank you for that lecture. I'm an art historian based at McGill in, in Montreal, and I've worked tangentially on Brunias in trying to build a context around James Hakewell, who was in Jamaica slightly oh, yes. later, right? Yes, and yes. And I'm um, really intrigued by your, your mention of the fact that Brunias almost utterly absents any scenes of plantation labor. And as you said, we're talking about a man who lived in the Caribbean for decades. So I'm wondering if you could, um, two things. One. Do you believe that this is something that he was directed not to represent by Young? And because again, you're saying he's 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 not the typical planter population himself. He's Italian and he's Catholic, so he's a so-called undesirable white at that time. He's not the ideal settler himself, so he's an outsider to a certain extent to the planter elite. And then the second part of that too then, in terms of erasure of the plantation, plantation labor, except for, as you pointed out, these signs in the city, like the man with the hogshead in the city street. Um, is there any indication that Brunius built patronage in terms of portraiture? Because so many of his works read as genre studies, like just meant to be a mulatto, a mulatto, yes. a mulatress, a negro, a, a carib. It, are there portraits that he made of specific well, that planters? That, that's an interesting question. There is a portrait that used to be attributed to Zoffany and um, someone I know who is an expert on 18th century por portraiture is attributed to Brunias. Um, and I think it possibly did do a few. Um, and he might well have, uh, this one of Young does, it's certainly of Young and it's not Zoffany. Um, and it, uh, and I, I think it very likely is by by Brunias, um, but he didn't do, um, as far as we know, he didn't do any particular uh, a series of portraits of settlers or anything like that. Um, and I don't think that was really quite his thing, really. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of genre you practiced in the 18th century was really what defined you. And 
Uh, and if you're a portraitist, then uh, you would have to behave in a certain way and um, mix in certain circles and also um, advertise that you were doing portraits. Um, and I think if you were seriously interested in it, there would be quite a few more. Um, and it may be that he tried with Young and felt this was these things would sell better or he would uh, or enjoyed painting them more. Um, but my, my general guess is that he's much more of an independent practitioner than simply Young's painter, even though Young brought him over. And the, the, again, the, the fact that he goes back to London and tries to set himself up as a, a and having engravings was a commercial decision. It was a way of publicizing what you did, um, just as Reynolds had prints made of his portraits. Um, that was a, way, a form of advertising and definition, self-definition. Um, so I'm inclined to think of him as someone who's more of a, a, a sort of independent businessman trying to find a way and also feeling that he had a better chance uh, in, uh, in the Lesser Antilles than he would have had in London. Um, again, art then was competitive, highly competitive, and he wasn't ever part of the Royal Academy set at all, um, except exhibiting there once or twice, but he didn't try to join as a lot of his Italian contemporaries did. Um, and so he, it, it seems to me, uh, you know, again, um, he clearly had quite a bit of success with these among the, the plantocracy, um, but not a huge success, I would say. I think he probably just about got by. And of course, living in, uh, in Dominica would have been considerably less expensive than in London. Um, and I think all these things, you know, w would have been quite a complex sort of self-negotiation, if you like, for him, uh, w where he would end up. Um, hi, David. Thanks so much. That was just really intriguing. I had a question regarding, um, do you know if Brunias ever included his works um, it with other kinds of materials like a travel narrative? Did he ever um, put one of his engravings or sketches with, with in dialogue with, for example, a cartographer's map or um, a, a description, an ethnographic description of plantation life or ceremonies? You know, and what might this dialogue with other, if, if it, it, to what extent um, it exists, what might this dialogue with other kind of um, materials from this period say about what's going on? Well, I mean, the, the simple answer is no, he didn't, but um, an awful lot of other people did. And what's extraordinary about Brunias was that there's so many reproductions, and when people did histories of of the Caribbean, they would use them quite in indiscriminately to apply to other islands. Um, and then there's a whole school in the, uh, some of the French colonies of artists who followed him. Um, and again, the, these things were used in all sorts of ways. I mentioned these buttons that were supposed to belong to Toussaint Louverture, but I mean, they were little tiny versions of these, um, uh, of these prints, and certainly of there are books on Saint-Domingue that use them as well. So all the kind of, as it were, careful attempt to localize these things um, in, in uh, Dominica and St. Vincent, of course, was, uh, they were then very widely distributed and became, I think, simply descriptions of the West Indies. Um, in fact, the whole Caribbean, really, of life. Because after all, there were not a lot of uh, similar images, and the, uh, none of them are quite as compelling or as attractive as Brunias's work. So they became a sort of shorthand for Caribbean life. Um, and I think in, in many ways um, created a lot of, uh, as it were, mis misinformation about, about the rest of the Caribbean. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, Thank you for the wonderful lecture. Two quick uh, comments, questions. Uh, uh, just a comment on this one. It's important, I think, to remember that in the case of Latin America, race is always not just correlated with phenotype at this moment. It's correlated with actions and 
yeah. uh, ideas of prestige and, yeah. and, and whatnot. So the idea of, of, a, of a, a, a elite woman being in public was very much frowned upon, which uh, asks questions as to w if this is elite, an elite white woman or, or something else. Yeah. Uh, especially if you consider the bucolic scenes of, of the domus of like harmony, right? On, on the more bucolic sort of like environment. Yeah. Um, the other question that I had or comment that I had, it struck me that the only scene of violence is among slaves. And I wonder if yeah. in his uh, larger work, uh, you s uh, mentioned, was mentioned earlier that the plantation is concealed, uh, but the scenes of violence among slaves are, are revealed. So I wonder if that says something about his well, work. Uh, well, yes. I mean, I mean there's, that's, of course, controlled violence, the uh, cudgel matches, uh, in, in a way, more like a boxing match than a you know, violence. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think it's, um, uh, I mean, I, I, I think first of all, um, what we really don't know is, is um, quite how different life was, what, what you would really have seen in, in Dominica. I mean, there were certainly some sugar plantations and they would have probably had um, similar conditions to ones in the bigger islands. Um, but um, he may not have been particularly aware of them and certainly wouldn't have wanted to emphasize them, I don't think. But um, I, I think that one possibility is that, um, that he in some ways felt he was really, uh, did associate himself with the mulatto population um, first of all, they, a lot of m mulattoes, male and female, were um, people, that sometimes people of wealth and, and, and social position because of their parentage. And, and uh, there were certainly mulattress who were, um, who had businesses and were quite wealthy at that point. Um, so the whole question of the, um, uh, of the, um, if you like, the pushback against this mixed race population was also a fear of their power as well and their growing influence. And may in the French colonies, uh, male mulattoes were often part of the militia and were there you know, to defend the colony against possibilities of slave revolt as well. So they're in this very complicated position. And I think in a way it has a lot to do with the, the Haitian Revolution too because in a way you could see that as what they were, um, the, the French authorities were frightened of would be a kind of gradual um, taking over as it were of the, 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 the islands by a very assertive mulatto population that could claim not only um, uh, uh, equal abilities, but also often equal education, equal social status. If your father was a, uh, a marquis de someone and your, uh, you, you certainly, uh, a mulatto person might well feel that he was in a superior position to some public French official who was trying to run the, uh, the government there. And I think there's a lot of that social friction that goes on um, in, in, again, particularly in the French colonies. Um, so it's a very complicated situation, I think. Um, and, uh, and of course, again, with these women who were very assertive and um, self-confident, um, this was again, I think, could be quite threatening um, and was seen as threatening to the social order, um, which is why you get these, uh, you know, very detailed books trying to lay out a kind of, of racial hierarchy in the late 18th century coming from the colonies and which were uh, and which an attempts were made to impose some of the rules and saying that for instance people of mixed race could not have any part in the government or not take on certain offices um, or must um, wear certain clothing and again sumptuary laws were also lingering at the background, in the background of all these uh, societies that you were identified yourself by the clothes that you wore.
Thank you for your presentation, David. Hi, I'm over here. Yeah. Um, so there's this idea perpetuated in the Latino community and certainly in places like Cuba and the Dominican Republic of mejorar la raza or to better the race by marrying someone who is white or lighter skinned than you. And I noticed that in several of these paintings, the mulatresses are being courted by white or European men, like the man in the yellow jacket. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if there was any instances where the mulatresses were being courted by African or darker skinned men. Um, not that I know of, not in, in Bruniatis paintings that I can think of. Um, uh, no, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it, I, I think there were quite a f I mean, we've talked about the codes that um, applied in various ways. There would have been probably codes also within the mulatto communities as well. Um, and I think they would have also been very conscious of wanting to dissociate themselves from uh, slaves, slavery as well. Um, I mean, they were certainly the, um, the more assertive mulat um, male mulattoes were in, you know, did not in fact accept that they were in any way inferior to the, the white governors. And I think this is all very important um, point really is this, this is for a, 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 a person like um, Edward Long, this would have felt very disorderly um, and would have been too fluid. I mean, what rulers tended to want in the 18th century was very clear hierarchies. They wanted, you know, their position uh, not to be fluid um, and to keep uh, all these distinctions as clear as possible. Um, and I think, of course, also if you're um, from uh, if you like, uh, upwardly mobile in the in these colonies as well. Um, again, you would want to separate yourself from the people beneath as well as uh, assert your equality with the, the ruling classes. Um, but anyway, uh, I mean, the short answer that I don't know of any cases of that in any of the paintings. Thank you.